Good evening, and welcome to Poetry at the Lexicon. I'm Rosamond Taylor. Thank you for coming. Um, and I'd also like to say thanks to the Lexicon for continuing to give us such a good home. It's been really wonderful to hear such positive feedback for this series. And I'm sure you'll all enjoy today's installment. Um, when I'm really excited and happy to say that we're going to be hearing from Will Harris, Hannah Lowe, and Molly Toomey. Um, so these poets are these are poets who are open to encounters, to the relationships we de develop in unexpected places, and who look at the way connection nourishes us or can trouble or hurt us. All three of them celebrate unexpected attachments with strangers in unfamiliar cities, between a teacher and a former student or in the context of a support group. In work that breaks rules, makes new rules, and pushes us out of our comfort zones, these poets are open to connection and encourage their readers to approach the world in a spirit of generosity and responsiveness. So I'm really excited they're joining us today. Welcome, Molly, Hannah, and Will. Um, before each poet reads, I'm gonna introduce them to you briefly, then they'll read for around 15 minutes. Afterwards, we'll discuss their work together. Um, and you should know that this event is captioned and you can turn on captions using the button to the left of the video. Um, DLR Libraries will also have copies of all these wonderful books. So I definitely recommend you check them out. So today we're gonna to hear from Molly first. Molly Toomey grew up in Lismore, County Waterford and graduated in 2019 with an MA in Creative Writing from University College Cork. She's been published in Poetry Ireland Review, Banshee, The Irish Times, Ms. Lexia, and The Stinging Fly. She runs an online international poetry event, Just to Say, sponsored by Jackar Press. In 2021, she was chosen for Poetry Ireland's Introductions series and awarded an Arts Council Literary Bursary. Her debut collection, Raised Among Vultures, is published by the Gallery Press. Tumi's crisp, vibrant debut captures the claustrophobia of living with mental illness. Using precise and imaginative images, she hones in on disordered eating, giving us snapshots of a world where food has become a source of fear. Nuanced and emotionally complex, her work looks at the relationships we have with our families and asks how we can best love one another when we are struggling with problems that feel insurmountable. Coping with mental illness can make our worlds feel narrow, but Toomey's work is always expansive, drawing on moments of surprising affection, on family ties, and on the colours and textures of the everyday, from a ball at a hurling match to a bat under a bridge. While unafraid of examining the bleak and raw, Toomey's work is also optimistic and generous in its view of the human and more than human world. So welcome, Molly. Looking forward to hearing you read. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosamond. That was really lovely. Um, it was one of the nicest introductions I've ever gotten. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honour to be here. I'm delighted to be asked. Um, and as, as Rosamond said, um, my work does deal with eating disorders. Um, so I was diagnosed with an eating disorder in 2015. Um, and a lot of my memories of that time are quite hazy um, because uh, my brain just wouldn't have been working properly and I don't, you know, I don't have a lot of memories of that time. But one memory I do have is of my father um, dropping me to uh, the residential centre. So I was in treatment for a few months um, and the first poem I'm going to read is called The Drop Off um, and it's about my dad um, and the silence in, in the car alongside him. So it's called The Drop Off. Everything's a blur. You don't play talking heads, Bob Dylan, talk about work or your iffy stomach. You read the road as if it's encrypted with what a father should say on a drive like this. Should I apologize for your missed appointments, unread emails? There is always someone who needs you more. 
Mostly, I'm sorry that I'm not as happy as you raised me to be. I want to ask the GPS the quickest route to end this silence. When we reach the center, you pull up and go straight for the boot. This is what you know to do, to lift the heavy thing. Tell me to take your good umbrella. You drag my suitcase to the door where the nurse stands with a notepad and clutches your arm. I'll come back soon, you say. But she smiles and says, it's better if you don't. Um, so I suppose, you know, a lot of, as Rosman was saying, a lot of this book does kind of deal with uh, my family and how I suppose an eating disorder kind of comes in and, and wrecks havoc not just on the person who is struggling but on you know I suppose anyone who loves them and cares for them and wants them to be well um, so this this next poem I'm going to read is is about um, my mother and it's also about you know another thing that's really difficult for someone with an eating disorder is you know public holidays so Christmas holidays you know Christmas Easter Halloween like they're all you know usually revolving around food so this poem is called Samhain uh, which is Irish for Halloween Samhain my mother lays a pumpkin on a black hospital tree she knows I cannot bob for apples snap a twix without wanting to throw myself off the pier. I cut its skull, scrape the rind clean. She tells me in the past women used to place embers in beets to ward off evil spirits, meaning she wants to reach into my bone cage, drag out the creature that bangs its hollow cup inside me. I want to hold her, tell her it will be okay. But my body has shrunk so tiny. If she touches me, she will break. I wipe the inner walls with bleach. Sometimes I wish the nurse would lay a hand on mam's wrist. Whisper, I am not her daughter. There was some mistake. But only the receptionist calls in to warn visiting times are over. My mother picks up her purse and smooths her jeans. Later, she tells me she found crushed eggshells and albumin smeared on her windscreen. She drove though she could not see, and kept asking God why he. I carve a mouth, beg it to speak. And um, so, you know, it, it's not just my, my parents who would have had to, um, I suppose, deal with uh, me when I was really mentally unwell um but also my brothers so I have I have two brothers a younger brother and an older brother and and my younger one was was quite young um when I was diagnosed and I often wondered you know how it affected him um and if you know I accidentally taught him bad habits or anything like that and it's something that I've thought about a lot 
him but something that's always struck me is is his uh, resilience um, and this this poem is about that it's called I teach my brother how to disappear so I teach my brother how to disappear what was it like for him to see me his sister Push away a bowl of honeyed Cheerios for dry spinach leaves, sprinting laps of the garden, swapping crayoned heights on the back door for black lines on the bathroom scales, tracking pounds to lose with a jar of marbles I used to flick and roll. My body like his raptor bath toy that shrank and clogged the drain, made our parents cross and loud as belly ache. Lately, any time he's sick or full, I'm scared I've taught him to use a bag of crisps or a bar of Milky Way. How could he learn to listen to his body as I hurled mine against the thin wall between our rooms, our worlds? The only trick I showed him was to disappear, but he's still here on the soccer pitch, scoring a hat trick in his studded boots, his guarded shins. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, the next poem that I plan on reading, um, it's it's about you know a phenomenon, I suppose, in in Ireland, which is uh, drinking in a field with your pals when you're a teenager, um, because you know I suppose there just wasn't a lot for us to do. Um, I come from a small town, um, but also I suppose in that in that gathering there was a sense of community, a sense that we could share things that we wouldn't have in other ordinary circumstances, a sense of freedom, um, you know. I suppose the drinking was just a clutch and we didn't know how to speak about our emotions in, you know, in ordinary life. We needed this excuse, you know, this excuse to have drank a little bit so now we can share what's really going on, what we were really feeling. Um, so it's called Knives We Used on Our Skin. Who did we imagine would pick up our filters? our shattered glass. Our minds were closed buds in the oaks and pines by the old ice house. We sparked firelighters through back naggins, cans of cherry cider. We sucked Bensons and mints, had our first kiss our last smoke. What did we know of a beer cap in a vixen's throat or the stomach of a hare gagged with cigarette butts? All we knew for sure was if we drank enough, we could voice the panic attacks we had before math. The mantras that our bodies were too big, too small, too riddled with spots. We confessed that we watched our mothers dice carrots with the knives we used on our skin and babysat kids by the river we dreamt of walking into. Here we uncapped what was held so tightly like a sluice trap after so many winters. Our tense jaws, our cramped hearts were held by the earth's nerves, 
those roots and vines that quietly lowered the pressure of our blood. Um, so this next poem is called um, 21 Questions, uh, which is a game um, where you're just asking your partner questions over and over. And I'm a really anxious person. So when I first started dating my boyfriend, I was playing 21 Questions but I don't know we were playing 21 questions and um, so I don't like the silence so I was always trying to fill it in and um, so this is called 21 questions have you ever lied to me I ask you reply that on our fifth date you said a rock hit the wheel but it was a chaffinch you didn't turn and hand me that small flame of news, but drove into the mango and gunpowder sunset. Afraid I'd make you pull up to check that there were no quavers stuck in its throat. That if its pulse didn't react to my fingers tap dancing on its keel bone. I'd want to bury it under heather and moss. You thought I'd make you pray every time we drove from Lismore to Ballyno, that our date would become not the boardwalk, chips and the anemone, but broken wings and blood wet feathers. I think of your ex in North. Carolina, how she might have perched and looked out to raised earth, waiting for you with your newly shaved beard, hand luggage of notebooks and craft beer, only for the fast and brutal machine of my heart to catch you off guard. So, um, the next poem that I will read, just have about a minute left or so. So I'm going to focus on just one last poem called Hiding, um, which, you know, I'm I'm doing, you know, I'm doing so much better in my life now. Um, and I'm so much happier and just surrounded by people, you know, that I love and who love me. And it's, you know, it's brilliant. But there, you know, there are still days that I, that I struggle and that I'm afraid or I don't want to you know, go out and, and face the world. Um, and I, I don't think that recovery is all, you know, blissful and flowery at the end. I still think it's really difficult. Um, and this poem is called Hiding. Um, Makushla just means my love. Hiding. Makushla holds a pillow over my face as a joke. This is how we love each other. Knowing we can suffocate one another, but won't. He wants me to get up, eat sourdough with tepanad, climb Mizen Head to peer into the dark guts of the Atlantic, hover our ankles over the 50 meter gorge. But I have ruined every cliff walk, mountain trail by calculating how many steps I can take, how much I can burn. It took so long to learn that I won't die if I sleep in or don't weigh the strain I inflict on the earth. Now, all I want is a life of shut curtains and holding the cracked teacup of my body's lips. The terrifying part is lifting the pillow, letting light back in. Um, so that's me. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much for listening. Um, it, that was really nice and really fun for me so thank you thank you so much Rosamond and um, thanks a million and thank you to John Leary thank you
It was so much fun. <laughs> Great to hear you read. And it's, yeah, it's wonderful to be able to share your work. Thank um, you. So next we're going to hear from Will Harris. Will Harris is a London-based writer. His debut poetry book, Rendang, 2020, is published by Granta in the UK and Wesleyan University Press in the US. It was a Poetry Book Society choice, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize and won the Forward Prize for Best First Collection. He co-edited the Spring 2020 issue of the Poetry Review with Mary Jean Chan, who was on an earlier episode of this. Um, and his second book of poems, Brother Poem, will be published by Granta in 2023. The word rendang crops up several times in Harris's collection of the same name. A meat dish from Sumatra, the word is also used to explore the roots of language and look at different facets of identity, as well as at Britain's colonial heritage. This is a book about encounters with strangers on London streets, with unexpected objects from history, or with figures in dreams. Full of contrasts and contradictions, Harris uses surprising imagery such as a toy echidna's beak, a lost piece of industrial concrete, or the multiple possible meanings of the phrase, a white jumper, to capture loneliness, gentrification, and multiculturalism. Because of his empathy, Harris is very open to the stories of strangers he meets along his way, and he takes his readers with him on these imaginative journeys. Rendang is an assured, exploratory book, which allows readers to meet the world with tenderness. So I can't wait to hear you read, Will, and welcome. Thanks, Rosamund. That was, yeah, such a great intro. Um, and yeah, really wanted to be here likewise. Um, <clears throat> I've been a little bit ill recently, so sorry if I'm kind of out of it. Talking to my computer now is pretty much the most talking I've done. Recently. Um, <clears throat> okay. I I don't. Yeah, maybe I'll just read um, oh, what I think of as the the first poem in um, Rendang. So there are there are multiple false starts because um, I was I love. The, the the architecture of a poetry book and the way you can play with it, and I kept on wanting to kind of preempt the reader's response. So the first thing you see is this um, concrete poem of words made up with rend, and then there's this epigraph poem which links on from that, and then there's finally the first poem, which is called Holy Man. Holy Man. Everywhere was coming down with Christmas. The streets and window displays ethereal after rain. But what was it? October? Maybe I'd been thinking about why I hated Tibetan prayer flags and whether that was similar to how I felt about Christmas. Things become meaningless, severed from the body of ritual, of belief. And I thought about those who see kindness in my face or see it as unusually calm, which must have to do with that image of the Buddha smiling. I turned off Regent Street and onto Piccadilly, then down a side road by Costa to German Street, where a man caught my eye as I was about to cross the road and asked to shake my hand. You have a kind face, he said. Really? He was wearing a diamond-shaped golfer's jumper and said he was a holy man. As soon as he let go, he started scribbling in notepad and tore out a sheet, which he scrunched into a little ball and pressed his forehead and the back of his neck before blowing on it, once, sharply, and giving it to me. I see kindness in you, but also bad habits. Am I right? Not drinking or drugs or sex, not like that, but bad habits. 2020 will be a good year for you. Don't cut your hair on a Tuesday or Thursday. Have courage. He took out his wallet and showed me a photograph of a temple, in front of which stood a family, his, I think. A crowd of businessmen flowed around us. Name a colour of the rainbow, any colour, except red or orange. He was looking to my right. And what I thought could be a rainbow. Despite the sun, a light wind blew the rain about like scattered sand. But when I followed his gaze, it seemed to be fixed on either a fish restaurant or a soup display, or maybe backwards in time to the memory of a rainbow. 
Why did he stop me? I've been dawdling, staring at people in business lunches, restaurants like high-end clinics, etherized on white wine. I must have been the only one to catch his eye, to hold it. What color could I see? I tried to picture the full spectrum arrayed in stained glass, shining sadly, and then refracted through a single shade that appeared to me in the form of a freshly mown lawn, a stack of banknotes, a cartoon frog, a row of pines, an unripe mango, a septic wound. I saw the glen beside the tall elm tree where the sweet briar smells so sweet, then the lane in Devon where my dad grew up, and the river in Riau where my mum played. It was blue and yellow mixed like Howard, Hodg like Howard Hodgkin's version of a Bombay sunset. A pistachio ice cream, a jade statue of the Buddha. I remember being asked, forced to give my favorite color by a teacher. Why did it matter? Which was the color of my favorite Power Ranger, of the knight beheaded by Gawain, of the girdle given to him by Lady Bertram, and chose the same again. The paper in your hand, if it is your color, will bring you luck. And if not, trailed off. First hold it to your forehead, then the back of your neck. And blow. I unscrunched the ball. Now put it here, he said, opening his wallet. And money, please. I had no cash. Nothing. He looked me in the eyes and said again that he was a holy man. I felt honor bound to give them something. Up and down the street, men rode to their important offices. I told him it was my favorite color, or had been. And as I did, I saw us from a distance, as we might see years from now. Scraps of coloured fabric draped across a hall, which, taken out of context, signified nothing. And I flinched, waiting for the blade to fall. As I was reading that, I was just thinking it was quite a, quite a funny choice to have as the first poem. Because, I mean, I feel like I am... I mean, even though I just transcribed that experience, Directly after it happened to me, I did me a holy man. I am also, I feel like implicitly, the holy man, the kind of con man in it, who is trading a kind of a, a visionary experience for cash. And the person who's reading that will have just bought a poetry book for cash as well. I don't know, there's something weird going on, maybe about my own fears of inauthenticity. I am pulling people. Anyway, um, what to? Um, a lot of the poems are quite long. Um, I'll just read a sh uh, one of the few short ones. The Hanged Man. He bought a seeded loaf and two ripe and ready avocados and left them in the hallway, and at lunch the next day went to Chipotle on Charing Cross Road, and back to work, and afterwards bought a ring donut from Tesco, because there were no jam donuts. That night, though he didn't think he was a hoarder, he started ordering records online, and soon he had bought the whole of Bruce Springsteen's back catalogue. I hate Bruce Springsteen, he thought. I want to eat better. The next week, listening to Human Touch, he dozed and woke to find himself floating two feet off the ground, hanging there. His parents were alive and dead. If only he could keep completely still, he could remain unscattered, forever on the edge of the brain. Um, okay, maybe we have time for like two more poems, I'm really sure. Um, so I'll, I'll read some poems from the new book, Brother Poem. <clears throat> um, it's actually got to the stage where I don't mind reading poems, older poems, though maybe other people will connect with the immense feelings of shame that are associated with older work, like seeing older aspirational versions of yourself. Um, okay, maybe we, this is a poem that I spent ages trying to write. In fact, Hannah has seen some versions of it, but it's in a new version. 
bad influence on that. Um, because I was trying to do something slightly different with narrative. Um, because the new book, the new book doesn't feature kind of story poems in the same way as the first book did. Like I kind of got into telling the stories, even though I've always thought myself as like a chronically bad storyteller. But I also really love anecdotes. I love the way, I love hearing other people tell anecdotes and like why they choose particular details and like exclude others and like how they get passed on and like walk over time. And so I wanted to write a poem which was more true to that kind of shape-shifting spirit of anecdotal transference. So this is a poem I wrote about someone I met while traveling in the US who, like me, was a child of immigrants and had ended up in, yeah, in this random small town and was going through quite a difficult period. And yeah, we only met like a couple of days because I was passing through the just try and write about that. And in fact, this, this will be the last thing I read. It's called Cuttlefish. We were sitting on the floor. I started writing as the window darkened, the grass grew bright. By morning, half the trees were submarine. What was it about being young and wanting to write? You said it wasn't choice, it was dictation. You had to ask. A frog leapt through the cat flap, taking refuge by our feet. You knew I had a brother, but we'd only met that night. Each time you forget and remember, the experience becomes truer. Like lightning in reverse, the fuse blew. I was stirring a pot of dal, with dog Annie asleep on the floor beside me, snoring. We went to a cafe whose name rhymed with dal, me playing with a small salt shaker, you talking about your brother. He had to go and you were about to go with him, but then you changed your mind. That night there was an accident. One second he was in his car asking if you wanted to come and you were about to, and that was that. We were strangers in a circle eating peach toddler. Someone played Galway Girl on a child's toy guitar. It's me, it's me, he screamed. He used to live on Grafton Street in Boston. Too late to leave and raining now. You talked about your brother. It was after college that you started writing. Lightning crackled in the air. You were all along me. I watched you heat a pot of dal, your dog asleep beside you. You planned to leave by 23 but changed your mind. To talk with shadows, you became a shade. Your eyes were red. You looked like him. I didn't know you had a brother. You had to ask. You don't have to believe. You were sitting on my parents' couch. You said, it wasn't choice. You were my brother. We were events in language. The window darkened and the grass grew bright. Can you hear that, cuttlefish? And uh, so there. Thanks again to Rosamond and to Molly and Hannah. Thanks so much, Will. It was great to hear you read. That was really fascinating. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it's always wonderful to hear everyone. It's always hard that we can't have kind of a clap at the end, but it was great to hear you read. Um, so next we have Hannah Lowe. Hannah Lowe is a poet, memoirist, and academic. Her latest book, The Kids, a poetry book society choice for autumn, won the Costa Poetry Award and the Costa Book of the Year. 2021. Her first collection, Chick, Blood Axe 2013, won the Michael Murphy Memorial Award for Best First Collection. In September 2014, she was named as one of the 20 Next Generation Poets. Her family memoir, Long Time No See, Periscope 2015, featured as Radio 4's Book of the Week. Her second collection, Chan, is published by Blood Axe 2016. She undertook her AHRC-funded PhD in creative writing at Newcastle University and now teaches in creative writing at Brunel University. The Kids, Hannah Lowe's award-winning collection, 
is a celebration of teaching told from the perspectives of teachers, students, and parents. Lo looks at the ways in which a rich life is always full of learning and how teaching is as much an imaginative ex experiment for the teacher as for the student. In the kids, Lo works exclusively in sonnets, which are so deftly crafted that they always feel spontaneous and full of energy. Lo's masterful use of form allows the reader to travel great distances, following ideas, emotions, and anecdotes within a small space. These delicately structured poems shine with potency and possibility, as well as wit and fun. Lowe's deceptively simple language captures the beauty, joy, and vibrancy of the ordinary. So welcome, Hannah. It's great that you could join us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And great to hear the other poets uh, in, the, in the room, the virtual room. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think I'll read um, some of the poems in the middle of the book, um, almost not, for my, not for my, just for me, but I've been reading an awful lot about the poems of me as being a teacher, so I thought I would read some of the other ones that are in the book about um, learning, and I thought I might stick a new poem in maybe as well. Um, so, you know, the book is full of good and bad teachers, and um, I actually don't like the idea of the bad teacher, I think is a very problematic one um, because obviously no teachers are intrinsically bad, but you have bad experiences sometimes in classrooms with teachers. So I'll take you back to an early uh, experience I had with Mrs. Vanuka. On the cold stone floor of the art cupboard, she knelt us down and her pudgy hands sold the rotted threw down the buckets. Dirty girls, let's see you spit. The clip clunk of her heels, the door's hard click. And we did, we did. I spat until my mouth was sore and my tongue was fat. While beyond the door we heard her chalk and the tip-top stab of her angry talk. I'd never known how much my own spit stank. I spat again, again, until my whole mouth ached. And beside me, Nisha sniffled and sobbed. We couldn't remember which of us first gobbed or what had happened to make us hate each other. And the base of those buckets still barely covered. You like to think that nothing like that goes on in schools today, but I'm also not sure that it doesn't either. Um, I'll read a poem about... Um, a good teacher, <laughs> a good experience, I should say. So when I, I went to a very traditional uh, secondary school and um, actually wasn't allowed into the sixth form because I was so naughty, but uh, I went off to the local FE college and there I met these two very um, radical teachers, both called John. And um, having just been studying at school the English literary canon and not really finding much love for it at that point um it completely blew my mind when um john tulan to whom the book is dedicated the first book he gave us for english a level was um entezaki shangays uh, for colored girls who considered suicide which is a choreo poem poem for dance about black women's experiences in america and i think again like like i've heard cuttlefish a couple of times will has definitely heard manifestations um this poem. The colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Our vows were flat as the dead fish that floated in Dagnum docks, but still John made us recite these lines meant for black women who said, I have poems, big thighs, little tits, which made us blush as our estuary tongues went tripping over cuz and enough, and the slashes the poet scattered over her page. And the whole bloody thing might well have been staged on another planet compared to Essex and my pals, whose mums served up school dinners, whose dads worked nights at Fords. We could just make out the half-rubbed words of last year's kids, discourse, nationhood, and soon I'd borrowed in my own new terms, hegemony, resistance, sisterhood. I'll read another poem for um 
John Tulin, um, slightly sentimental poem, but he was really the first um, teacher uh, that had high expectations of me, which I think is such a critical thing in teaching and learning. You know, I was talking to someone earlier about being streamed into maths uh, sets when I was at, in the first year of secondary school. Um, and I was streamed into the bottom set of math. And I've held like an almost lifelong view of myself as not being able to do math, which I think is um, a, a partly about that streaming. The idea of saying to a child at 11, you can't do this, is so problematic. Um, and I had the opposite experience with John Toulon. He, he, he said, you can do this. You, you're good at this. Not maths, but English. <laughs> John one pink hummingbird. The postcard he sent to you in that long wet summer had on one side a pale pink hummingbird and overleaf his notes on your essay on Faulkner in his usual turquoise ink the words you imagined written in sunlight on the bed of his book stuffed flap each weighed with care like a love letter it was you that wanted him. All summer you waited for September to be back again in the tattered classroom, the tables pushed together, and him at the top, like a doting father or a bridegroom, or like God, if God wore Dr. Martin's shoes and a silver sleeper in one ear. Not the God you didn't believe in, but one who believed in you. So there are other types of learning going on um, in this book, and I'll read. Um, a poem about um, the, I don't know, the transmission of bad, of bad habits, I guess. Um, it's also very much about my parents, players. My parents taught me smoking. The midnight nip to the SO garage for 20 players. The kitchen table vigil, lighting one tip from another and another. No matches or lighter. They bent to the cooker's flame. No credit, no cash. My dad would search the bin to twist tobacco from dog ends, squeeze it, suck it in. Or flush, they pile nine or ten black boxes on the bureau, small coffins in a stack. Stained walls, grey fog, the constant tweezering of fags that plug between the lips. It took me years to stop. Though still, some lonely nights, I spark one up, and that red light in the darkness leads me back to where they're waiting, holding out the pack. Um, I'll read. Um, I'll read a poem from the earlier section of the book, which is really about kind of about expectations. When I was, um, and also I'm going to read it because Will helped me with this poem so much. <laughs> he helped me find the ending or like move a line in the poem. And um, it's about taking students to the theatre. So I was a sixth form teacher and uh, for years, 10 years. And I, before like risk assessment and health and safety and the bureaucratic nightmare of all of that, we used to take our kids quite often to the theatre. And these were kids that hadn't, um, often been to the theatre much some of them had but most hadn't and uh it was a quite a new experience for them often and I remember saying to them you know like the theatre can be quite a you know um a middle class place and uh, I remember saying you can get um food in the you can get ice cream in the interval but it's very expensive so maybe bring your own food and then one one time we took them to see Twelfth Night and I looked down the aisle and uh, they took me at the, my, my word and pulling out of their rucksacks two litre bottles of Fanta and Tupperware's fried chicken. And <laughs> they were so great. It was brilliant. It felt so subversive taking um, 60 kind of rag and taggle looking 16 year olds to see something, you know, some very kind of like um, proper Play. Often Shakespeare we took them to see at the National or at the Barbican. Um, so I'll read this. So my, a colleague of mine who shall rem remain nameless, the epigraph is from him. He says, this is more like bloody dog walking than teaching. The sixth form theatre trip. You've got more dogs than you can count. Big dogs and small. 
one badass dog in headphones mooching up the aisle. A dog who smuggled in a hot dog. Two loving dogs, back row, already smooching. Some dogs are up on haunches, barking. A dog or two already dozing, heads in paws, dogs sighing and dreaming. The other theatre dogs look down their snouts, a pair of tutting chow chows, some slony poodles in the box. But when the curtains lift and your dogs are hypnotised, their ears like little hoisted sails, the wag of tails, their shining dog hearts fling wide open. They know these words, these lines, memorised like buried bones. Don't you love your dogs? Um, I did love, I love those kids so much and I miss them now. It's I don't teach them anymore. Um, many of them will be like in their 30s, probably now, early 30s, 30s, 20s. Um, I thought I'd read a couple, I can't stop writing sonnets. Since writing this book, that's now I've got like a, a long-term condition <laughs> that needs exercising. So I've been writing like more sonnets. So I thought I'd read, um, I thought I'd read three more poems and I'll read, these are quite new. So I've not shared them with anyone at all before, but uh, I was thinking about my own son who seems to have like quite, quite a lot of him in the kids, um, but he's eight now and his imagination surprises me all the time. And sometimes when he says he does something, he writes a story or something, his dad will say, oh, where'd you get that from? You know, like chip off the old block kind of thing. But I, but I just don't, f I feel like, I don't feel like it's nature or nurture. I just feel like he surprises me so much. I feel like it's like almost like nothing to do with me. Um, but it also reminded me of a, an argument um, me and my siblings had with my father. So, goat. One Christmas Eve, we argued with my father nature versus nurture he kept saying nature not knowing that nurture which he'd never done was better he thought his scattered children shone a torch back on him as though he were the river and we the tributaries him the giver us the gifts our brains certificates our jobs him the cloth and us the cup when I watch my small boy draw a goat and colour in its beard, I think it's neither. His mind's a tin of magic, from which some days he pulls a purple squirrel, a talking stingray, a song of tinsel. He paints himself a boat, goes sailing down his own full-hearted river. And I'll read uh, a poem that's about... Um, I suppose like kind of discovering my own creativity, which happened um, quite late in my life, I guess. It happened because I was a teacher in my late 20s. Um, and I think I hadn't realised that I had, I mean, I don't think there's any such thing as like a poet's soul, <laughs> but I do think that poets often look at the world in different ways and none of those ways will be the same. And maybe... Uh, feel things in different ways, feel the need to write about those things. Um, and I think for much of my 20s, I was doing a lot of feeling, but not a lot of writing. Um, in fact, I was, I was spending a lot of time going out and, and basically getting trashed, essentially. So that's what this poem is about. It's about the kind of person you are before you realise the kind of person you're becoming, if that makes sense. I lifted an epigraph from uh, Anne Sexton. Um, I have done my hitch over the plain houses, which comes from her poem, Her Kind. This is called That Kind. I was the kind of woman who would show up to a party knowing no one, having heard the thud of techno from my window, the blip of synth like a scent to follow. I'd leave my bed at midnight to hunt it out, swaying down a hallway. Necking borrowed wine, sniffing a line of shining powder from a cistern, maybe kissing, maybe not, tumbling back home at dawn. Weekdays after work, I'd smoke a roll up, looking out across the Clapham chimneys. And once I took my brushes and oils and tried to paint the mood that lurked inside me, a sad and silent shade of blue, not knowing I was that kind of woman too. 
And I'll finish by reading the very last poem in the book, which is about, I gave up all my bad habits in the end. <laughs> it's about yoga, but it's also about poetry. Um, and it's about, you know, like the idea that w- we're always learning our formal education finishes at 18 or 21 or whenever it finishes. And then, you know, we're sort of meant to, there's an idea that we're formed then and that everything else is like, you know, we're just going on and applying ourselves. But I found in, in my life, I've always been learning something new and sought out new things to learn um, as well. Uh, so the poem is named after two yoga teachers, Kathy, Carla. The body is something like a poem, I guess, as I watch my yoga teacher, Kathy, on the back row mat of Carla's yoga class. Kathy can do king pigeon, crow, or monkey. Yet here she is in a simple forward bend while Carla lays her palms around her core to push her deeper. Can every pose be deepened, I wonder, and what's been mastered be mastered more? The poem is something like a body, I guess, when I'm holding someone else's poem in this sun-filled room they've called a masterclass. I'm not a master, just a pair of palms which push or pull or loosen someone's lines. I still need kind and guiding hands on mine. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. That was brilliant. It was so wonderful to hear you read. I really enjoyed it. And thanks so much to to Bill and Molly as well. I was going to jump in with some questions and just, and if you guys would like to talk to one another as well, that's completely allowed, in fact, encouraged. Um, My first question, I think I was just, I was thinking about this in relation to all three of your work, but um, I think Will actually started, mentioned it, that, um, whether deliberately or not, a lot of poems can tell stories. Um, and I wanted to ask Will to begin with, um, would you feel like narrative drives your work and how does that process go for you? Um, I, I don't feel like narrative drives my work at all. Like, like I said, I, I've always thought of myself as like a non storytelly person. In fact, I always used to kind of quite dislike people who, who like who like told stories in that really like ostentatious way. Um, and when I started writing poems, the kind of poems I liked were more like were more uh, disjunctive, more linguistically innovative, or were more image based. And so things like using an eye, a consistent eye, which is often necessary for storytelling, and just recounting something. I don't know, it was it was kind of like I get worked against my instincts. But I found it I can I just ended up writing these poems almost in spite of myself because I decided I didn't want to write a book that was about me. And then in order to do that, I needed to incorporate other lives into it. And narrative worked as this way of doing that. And I just so I just kind of fell into writing stories and but yeah i still feel like i have a mixed uh, I, I have an ambivalent relationship towards towards narrative um i don't know but that sounds kind of stupid as well it's, I mean, it's a very like abstract idea what is what is narrative there are some so there is there's like a tradition of experimental poets who like really dislike narrative which like, doesn't make sense to me because narrative at its root is just a series of events, um, and I think it's a useful ballast to the lyric impulse, which is everything being um, kind of funneled towards one particular moment. And I found I wanted to move away from that sense of like you know the lyric insight or like the epiphany, and narrative worked to push the poem away from that, so that it could be more open, more expansive, and more like centered around. Lives of others. How did others? Yeah, I think it's yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> we often um, I think we're often we are resistant to narrative as poets, and yet I think it is something that crops up again and again. Would you find that with your work, Molly? Um, 
I don't know. I don't think I think a lot about it. <laughs> I think I just write, you know. Um, and I don't think I ever. I don't I actually don't think I reflect a lot, you know, about my writing process either. I do know that I'm really bad at storytelling. Like I used to do. Like I did a fiction class before, and I couldn't. I just it was too overwhelming. Um, so I think it suits me just to not think about it. And if a poem happens to have a kind of narrative um, behind it, then that's, you know, I, I like narrative um, and I like poems that have a clear narrative. Um, I don't know why. I suppose it's like that sense of progression as well. Um, but then obviously I don't like I don't like neat narratives either. I don't like when they when they close too neatly. Now, I don't know. Like I've never really thought about it but my, my poems do a lot of them do um have a narrative and I, I i prefer it if i'm writing about someone else um it's easier um yeah i don't really know I, i'm sorry i don't have clear <laughs> yeah i think i i think i'm asking this question because i think i thought i interpreted a narrative into your poems maybe even if you didn't um yeah. if you didn't see it there yeah. yourself yeah I definitely that's interesting like Hannah's poems have quite a lot of um, anecdote or storytelling in them. Would you agree with that, Hannah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, poems, the poems that I first read and loved were like pretty narr- like deeply narrative poems. So I suppose I like the idea um, of uh, like the testimony to lived experience and all that kind of stuff but I can't re- I don't really see the narrative can't just be a story like there has to be I suppose like the lyric impulse there has to be the epiphany or like what does the story uh like what is the story really about and, and increasingly I think because I am a storyteller like I've always been like that it's like part of the way I talk in the world but increasingly I start to wonder like what does the story hide when you start when you start telling a story and there's no room for anyone else to kind of get in there like what are you like what is behind what is behind that I think I think the narrative could sometimes be a bit um like a shield in some way this is the way things went and that's that whereas actually um increasingly I think narrative kind of exists to kind of as sense making like how you make sense of uh, of an experience or of uh, like and it's not static like stories they they change in poetry i mean the sonnet doesn't really allow you to um do as much storytelling as i probably like uh, but that's probably good for me it's probably good form stopping like cutting the story short somewhere um but i don't have the same no i don't I think poetry is a poor church and there's room for everything, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find narrative really interesting because I think it's often added on afterwards. Like an experience doesn't tend to fit a narrative very well. But then I think our instinct is maybe as writers or maybe as people to kind of give it a narrative <coughs> and that's how we kind of interpret it to ourselves. Um, the other thing I was thinking about, well, thinking about various things but um I was reading a book of Louise Gluck's essays recently and one thing she was saying she was quoting Emerson and she said and Emerson said to believe your own thoughts to believe what is true in your own private heart is true for all men that is genius and I was kind of thinking I, I don't know if I agree but um I was wondering how much do you think it is possible to find the universal through our own experiences and whether that's even something that you really you really want to do as a poet um who will i pick on here who would like to answer first well you look thoughtful (laughs) i feel like i i didn't do that well last time going first (laughs) Um, I think we should remember Anna. I feel like. What was the question? What was it? The question is: um, Do you think we can find the universal through writing about our own experiences, or is that something we even want to try and do? Um, I suppose I think that you know, uh, poems 
you know, I, I, I teach that poems should always be very sort of, you know, they need specificity of experience, specificity of object, specificity of uh, language, et cetera, et cetera, which seems to like run like counterintuitively from the idea of things being universal. But I suppose readers are humans and humans have souls and hearts and and therefore uh, uh, you know a poem that is about very specific experience that maybe couldn't have happened to anyone else but let's say it involves deep regret readers many readers will respond to that because they felt regret about something in their own lives or even just are familiar with regret as a as a problematic and a difficult you know difficult emotion so I think there's you know it's that kind of it's that I almost think the more specific the poem is, the more likely it is. But I don't think universal is necessarily the right uh, the term that I w- would use. But it's about um, yeah, emotional uh, relativity and yeah, like the humane. It's about calling on people's humanity. Um, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all looking for that kind of humanity within work how do you find it molly do you find it yeah um, um, do you find people respond I, I, well to, when you write about your own experiences yeah i mean because i mean my, a lot of my work is really uh specific and, and, and about my own experiences and and i would hate for someone to be like oh i can't read that because like i didn't experience any of that so i'm not going to feel anything you know i think and i think i i read a lot of work um that is about about things that I don't I don't know anything about. But if I can get the kind of if I can get to the core or the emotion of what's going on, then I can relate to the work. And that's where the power is for, for me. I think, you know, if I can, you know, feel something um that I feel is probably similar to, you know, the speaker behind a poem, um, then I think that's where the resonance is and that's where the richness is um for me. And I, I you know, I hope that, you know, someone reading my book um is able to you know relate to some of the emotions behind the work maybe they can't relate to you know some of the acts or whatever is being described but if they can tap on the same kind of emotion you know I think that that's uh that's really important for me I think that that's one of the effects that I want by work and um yeah yeah I think that's um something I would find as well that um I think we're often told that through very specific we kind of find something universal um or maybe Mm. not universal but something that many people can relate to um sometimes i kind of i want to work against that and kind of find the just write about the very specific and not care about whether it is applicable to anyone or not These are my private poems just for me. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you should write like that though, right? I don't know how, because, oh yeah, I, I don't know, how, how would you write in a way that would be applicable to others? Especially with poetry, it seems. Um, I don't know, I, I never think about like readers or audience. That's the kind of implied question there. Uh, you write, yeah. Um, but at the same time, it is a really interesting question because I think people do come to poetry for a certain kind of universal experience, which they don't expect from other, um, from like a novel, I suppose. Um, and if you look at what is popular, like, I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of Insta poetry is basically channeling that pure, pure universal. It's all like they're almost like Afro, you know, these kind of aphorisms that reflect on the, the human condition. And I kind of think you can you can write poems like that. I have I have this argument with a, a friend, which is ongoing, who basically thinks that poems should just be about the sky, and that all the best poem, poems about the sky. And I'm like, well, are you really running about the sky? Are you running about your parents' divorce when you were like 11? And he's like, no, man, I don't believe in that. <laughs> um, but then you could have, I, I don't know, I, I like lots of poems which have no, um, 
specific or personal. And the thing is, you've got to you've got to make the, the language has to be really good to be able to. If you have no um, personal or specific, what can, I, what can I just write like mood mood pieces? Yeah, I think my tension all the time when I'm thinking about this is that I want to. I think it's very freeing to feel like you don't have an audience. It doesn't matter. Um, and then at the same time, I think part of the the work in crafting a really good piece of writing is because there is an implied audience. Um, and I think the two things kind of work in a sort of in a sort of attention for me anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. I the think kind of exposure. I always think of it more in terms of exposure, like that kind of, um, kind of thrill of that. You know, if you were writing without knowing and anyone would ever see it, you would kind of lose that energy. Yeah. Yeah, I was just talking to somebody about how when you're not, it's been hard to read our poems aloud to an audience for a long time. And I think now that we could do that, more easily again it makes the poems feel different even if i'm not going to if i'm not planning to read them to anyone for a long time the idea that there could be a live audience at some point makes it different again um i don't know if anyone else has experienced that i don't think so much about a live audience um maybe because i'm uh slightly reticent about reading in public even though i do it loads it's not the thing like, if I'd been given a choice to do that or not do it, I'd have chosen not to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I do think about them. I do think about re other readers. I particularly think about, like, two groups, really. One is people that I know will read them, like like Mimi Calvati, who has mentored me for years. Like, I've often sort of had her sitting on my shoulder saying, is it a poem, darling? <laughs> self-indulgent no love note <laughs> and um yeah. and I think about other readers that are implicated right because I've written about so for example in writing about my students I I definitely thought about how they how they would see themselves and I thought about the other groups of which I'm part like the other communities like teachers how other teachers that I know would I mean, I did, yeah, but I kind of had to. It probably didn't start like that. I probably just felt I wanted to write a poem about. But at some point, particularly with the kids, I did really think about the different kind of communities and the ethics of what of what the book was saying. Yeah. So I, yeah, I do think about readers, but probably probably not in the first um, instance. Yeah, it's definitely a process of going from an idea to what you think that people, I think yeah, the, and the audience is far down that road. There are some poems that you start writing and you, I'm saying to myself, you can never publish this. Um, but then you Will's right, it kind of loses a bit of energy, but at the same time, you still feel like you want to write it. I think that's a good point for us to, to finish up. So... It was really great to be able to have this conversation with you and to, I mean, it was wonderful to have you here and to hear you all read. Um, and I'm really happy that you could all join us. Um, and so just, yeah, thank you. And um, thanks to everyone who's watching this event. And we should be holding one more installment of Poetry at the Lexicon this year. So please look out for that. And I'll just say good night to Molly, Will and Hannah. And, and good night to everyone watching, and thanks again. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you.